You know, one of the things that uh, I've noticed about our movement is that conscious capitalism attracts a lot of people who, well, let me back up even further. There's a meta-narrative about business in our society that, uh, that my friend, the founder of uh, Stakeholder Theory, Ed, Fre Ed Freeman says, he says, John, the dominant narrative about business in our society is business sucks, right? People don't like business. You can see corporations have horrible ratings. They're seen as, as uh, they're greedy and selfish and exploitative. Business is seen that way frequently. I mean, 90% of murders you see on television are committed by businessmen, when in reality, of course, they commit far less than 1%. Uh, business is seen as just strictly about money. It's, Arthur Brooks today was talking about, uh, about how he can, he can talk all about prosperity and ending poverty, and, but business is still seen and capitalism is still seen as, as not ethical, fundamentally based on uh, the worst elements of human nature. And so I've, over the years I've noticed a lot of people are attracted to conscious capitalism who feel guilty about being in business, who feel guilty about being capitalist, and think that, or hope, that they can atone for the horrible crime of being a business person through good works. That they're not like all the rest of those capitalists. They're a, they're a cut above. We are cut above because we are conscious. We are you know, with higher purpose. We care about our stakeholders. We're trying to, we care about our culture. We want, we want our people to flourish. And that makes us better and higher and not so guilty. And so we're stuck in that business sucks narrative, and so many people are attracted to our movement, have imbibed that narrative themselves, and in a sense are attempting to overcome it through, again, through almost, a, in, in a religious terms, through good works. That somehow that we can escape the trap. And this just troubles me so much that uh, instead of talking about conscious capitalism in my talk today, I'm going to talk about capitalism. I want to talk about the prosperity and goodness of capitalism because I think business is awesome. And it is by far the greatest value creator in the world. And I'm going to put a ton of slides up here, and I'm going to show it. And I hope that by the end of my talk, you're going to feel as good about business and capitalism as I feel about it, knowing that as good as it is, we can make it a lot better. Conscious capitalism, though, stands on the platform of capitalism itself and then seeks to elevate humanity from that platform to a higher place. So let's just get into it. So what the heck is capitalism in the first place? It's better thought of as, as a philosophy. It's a set of ideas. And I'm going to put up a slide in a minute that's going to show the 10 core principles that are the foundation of it. And then think about it when I put these principles up there in just a second, that, that anti-capitalism is kind of the opposite. It rejects these 10 core principles as fundamentally not good. And, but here's the thing. When a country increases its economic freedom, when it embraces more capitalistic ideas, it increases prosperity, and it decreases poverty. There are really just no exceptions to this. It's, it plays itself out uh, over and over and over again. So when a country like, like Hong Kong or Chile or Singapore increases economic freedom, then they become, they become very wealthy. Other countries go the opposite way, say Venezuela or uh, Greece or North Korea and they become very poor. That's what, it, what ends up happening. When a country like China or India start to reform their economies, create more economic freedom, they begin to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And that's just the way it works. So here they are. Here's 10 key pr uh, pr principles. I'm going to leave it up there for a second. I'm not going to explain each one of these in, some in detail, but property rights, ability to trade freely international, 
Uh, sure, you have to have regulations, got to have rules of the game, but they're moderate regulations that make sense uh, and, and not over the top. You have to have a relatively small government compared to the private sector, as opposed to a monstrous government that, that, that controls everything. Um, sound money that you can count on, that the government's not uh, either uh, creating massive deficit spending or inflating in a way through printing money. Rule of law, same rules apply to everyone, whether you're the president, running for president, or just an average citizen, same rules apply to everyone, that's the rule of law. Entrepreneurship, capitalism is ultimately based on entrepreneurship and the freedom to innovate, which necessarily means you also have the freedom to fail. You're not propped up by business, I mean by government. If, you're, if you don't succeed, then you go out of business. And that allows uh, assets to be redistributed and progress continues. I'm going to talk more about this in a minute, but it's ultimately based on a voluntary exchange. It's a voluntary exchange economy. No one is coerced to exchange. That's the fundamental ethical principle of why capitalism is ethical. It's not based on coercion. It doesn't have guns. It trade, it's based on voluntary trade. And it has high social capital because you can't do it or be successful without trust, without honesty, without fairness. And, and nations like in the... Uh, the Nordic countries have very high degrees of social capital, far higher than the United States has, and that allows them that that uh, allows them to 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 innovate and create and uh, uh, do such in such a way that everybody in a society like that is winning. So th this is interesting. These are like the top 11 countries in the world in terms of economic freedom. I had to put the United States in there because they were number 11. Otherwise, I'd have cut it off at 10. Uh, What's very interesting is throughout most of our history, the United States would have ranked number one. For almost the entire history of the United States, we were the most economically free nation in the world. And until 9-1-1 happened, we still ranked number three. But after 9-1-1, everything began to change. Uh, with the Patriot Act, more regulations occurred, and the United States now has slipped down to number 11. And what's pretty interesting about that is Every major English-speaking country in the world now ranks ahead of the United States. Think about that. Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Ireland, and even the UK is now more economically free than the United States, which is pretty interesting if you think about it. Now, what happens is, again, the more economically free you are, the more prosperity your country creates. Honestly, if you want to know why the United States is not creating as many jobs and our GDP isn't as high as it used to be, you don't have to look any further than we're basically decreasing economic freedom in the United States. As we decrease our economic freedom, we're also decreasing our prosperity. Here you can see that based on quartiles, the economically most free nations have the highest standard of living for their citizens until you get down to the least free and they have the least prosperity. What I don't think most people realize, and I'm, I'm going to show some slides here, that the economic success that capitalism and business has created in just the last couple hundred years has never happened before. It's unprecedented in all human history. In fact, I will argue that capitalism itself is the greatest creation that humanity has collectively done, because it's been the platform for almost all the other advancements. 200 years ago, 90%, over 90% of the world was poor, at about the level of Bangladesh today. But since that time period, we've increased per capita income by 10x across the whole planet, by 16x in the developed countries. Japan, 35x. South Korea, 26x just since 1960. And the most staggering statistic of all, Hong Kong, which is the most economically free place in the entire world, has increased its prosperity for its citizens 87x, 8,700% in just the last 56 years. It's, it's unbelievable. No, no country, no nation has ever done anything remotely similar to that. 
This is, I love this slide because it just shows what capitalism has done graphically. These are based on uh, GDP per capita, $1990. But look what happened from the year zero to the year 1000. GDP actually per capita decreased. It didn't even increase in a thousand years. We sometimes hear about like a lost decade. God, maybe the, the, the 2000 to 2010 was a lost decade for the United States. We're talking about a lost millennium, a thousand years of just stagnation. It barely got any better the next 700 to 800 years. And then around when the Industrial Revolution got going in 1750, when capitalism, the wealth of nations came out in 1776, Something happened that had never happened before. Prosperity began across the planet, starting first in Holland, then the UK, then the United States, then the continental Europe. And now in the last 60 years, it spread to places in South America, the Asian tigers, and increasingly all over the world. And that is, of course, Decreasing global poverty. We can talk all we want about, yeah, we need to do things to help aid the poor people. That, and all the efforts that uh, governments do and nonprofit organizations do, hey, my company supports a foundation, uh, the Whole Planet Foundation, which has now helped over 5 million poor people in the last decade, something we're, we're really proud of at Whole Foods Market. And yet all that aid from governments and nonprofits is nothing, nothing compared to what capitalism has done. This is actually the most important slide I'm going to show here. Look at this. In 1820, 95% of everyone alive on the planet Earth was poor. 95%. And 85% lived on less than $1 a day. 85% of everyone alive. And that's adjusted for $2,014. Look what's happened since capitalism we have decreased poverty down to about a 50% mark across the planet, and we've taken abject poverty of less than a dollar a day, actually down to less than a dollar 25 a day, down to about 13 or 14%. The trajectory is clear. We are going to end abject poverty on the planet Earth in the next 25 years. Capitalism is going to do it as it goes into Asia, as it increases and goes into Africa, uh, it's going to do what it always does. It's going to create prosperity, and it's going to lift the masses out of poverty. One of the most important things to do if you're going to be poor is be poor in a capitalistic country. Because look how much better off you are. I mean, in mostly free countries like the United States, the average uh, income for a poor person is you know, $10,000. It's not very much, but it's a heck of a lot better than $1,629. I love this quote by Jane Jacobs. This is very important. To seek the causes of poverty in this way is to enter into an intellectual dead end because poverty has no causes. Only prosperity has causes. Wealth is not the problem in the world. Poverty is the problem. And here's the thing that most people don't understand. Wealth doesn't cause poverty. Poverty is the default condition of the human race. Human race has been poor. 200 years ago, 95% of everyone alive was poor. It's capitalism that's creating the wealth and the prosperity that is literally lifting humanity out of the dirt. Because it's not a zero-sum game. The metaphors that people think wrongly about business is if somebody becomes rich, then someone else must be getting poor. They have this idea that there's a fixed pie, and if somebody gets a bigger slice of the pie, then somebody else is getting a smaller piece of the pie. That's not how business works. Stakeholder theory puts the lie to that, doesn't it? Because in stakeholder theory, we see that all the stakeholders are trading voluntarily with the business for mutual gain. So uh, the customers are gaining, or they wouldn't be making the trade. The employees, team members are gaining, or they wouldn't be exchanging with the business. Suppliers are gaining. Investors are gaining. Communities are gaining. It's, it's a positive sum game of win, 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 win. Business people 
get that in our bones. The rest of society doesn't get it. So it's very important for you to understand. The media doesn't get it. They think that there are these rich people that are taking all the money, and that's keeping everybody poor. And uh, I'm going to uh, deal with this in a little more detail in a few more slides. But stakeholder theory shows the importance of the win-win-win prosperity that business creates. And it's our job, our duty, as entrepreneurs, as business people, to explain this tirelessly, because other people don't understand it. And they won't understand it if we don't explain it to them. Ultimately, there is not a problem of an unequal distribution of wealth in the world. The problem is that there is an unequal distribution of capitalism. There is an unequal distribution of capitalism. We got it. Other countries don't have it. If we want to increase and spread prosperity, it's not by redistributing money. It's by redistributing ideas. The ideas about the basis, the 10 principles I put up there about how capitalism works. What else has capitalism done besides just create wealth? Look at this. For 30,000 years, the average lifespan of humanity was 30 years or less. For 30,000 years. And in just the last 130 years, we've increased it from about 30 years to 71 across the planet. In more developed countries, it's approaching 80. In a place like Japan, which has the the highest lifespan in the world is it's closer to 83, 84, with women being up uh, even up in the 86 and 87 range. Decreasing illiteracy. This is just, do you know that before capitalism, 90% of the people on the planet couldn't read? 90% could not read. They were poor, 95% poor, 90% couldn't read, and we are ending illiteracy across this planet incredibly fast by historical levels. We have dropped illiteracy at the rate it's going now, I think by the end of this year, it's estimated it'll only be about 14% across the planet. Capitalism has made that possible. Cop capitalism has created the platform for mass education in order for people to begin to read and to know how this world works. Okay. Fine. As Arthur Brooks was saying earlier today, okay, people might grant you that capitalism is, it delivers prosperity for some of the people, the rich people, but it's still ethically inferior to something like socialism. Look how much support Bernie Sanders had. It was, it was fascinating to me. I, just was, I, was just I was always reading about Bernie Sanders because he seems to be somebody who cares. He cares about poor people. These business people don't seem to care about anybody but their, themselves and their bottom line. And so capitalism is seen as possibly delivering more prosperity, but it's not good. It's unethical. And that is the way it's oftentimes portrayed by intellectuals, who I oftentimes state the intellectuals are the class enemies of business. Think about that for a minute. The class enemies of business are the intellectuals. It's always been that way. Business people have routine, if you study history, you'll see business people have been attacked, not recently, just recently, but throughout all history. The Jews were systematically prosecuted in the West, not because they were Jews, because they were good business people, and they made money through trading, and they created envy, and so they were routinely run out of countries. Same thing happened to the Chinese in the East. The great business people in the East have been the Chinese, and boy, oh boy, when they've, they've been just as persecuted as the Jews have been persecuted. So let's talk about what makes capitalism ethically superior to every other economic system, not just to look because it creates prosperity. The basis of business and capitalism is that it's based on voluntary exchange. No one has to trade with anyone else. There's no gun to people's heads saying, make this exchange. People do it because they want to, because it's in their interest. If people don't like Whole Foods Market, we've got plenty of competitors who are happy to serve them. Way too many competitors, I might add. <laughs> but that's the way capitalism works. It forces us to get better. It forces us to innovate. It forces us to meet the competitive test or lose business to our competition. 
So socialism makes a claim that capitalism is based on exploitation. But if it's based on voluntary exchange, how can it be exploitation? It isn't, because capitalism does not have the guns to force people to trade. No one's forced to work at Whole Foods Market, and when they find a better job, they quit, and they take it. When customers think our prices are too high, they go shop somewhere else. If our suppliers are mad at us, they don't have to trade with us. If our investors, we're a public company, if our investors are unhappy, they sell their stock, or they become activists trying to get us to change things. So the whole myth that capitalism is based on exploitation is, is uh, it's just not true. It's fundamentally not true. The exchanges occur for mutual gain. That's just such an important thing to remember and to repeat. On the other hand, a system like socialism is based on coercion. Government deciding what you should be, who you should be buying from, who you should be selling with, who you should be working for, what your wages should be. So it's ultimately based on a type of coercion. With, if you ever try to resist, it may be sweet, you don't, uh, um, but when you resist, you will find that guns eventually come and make you do what they want you to do. I know because occasionally I do resist. <laughs> um, I've already talked about this volunteer exchange. So competition, of course, makes, it gives us choices. It forces businesses to innovate and improve or they fail. Socialism doesn't allow failure. It props up the losers and that prevents innovation it prevents entrepreneurship from disrupting and changing things. And as a result, uh, socialistic systems inevitably stagnate, lacking that competition. All you have to do, think about it for a minute. United States Postal Service versus UPS or FedEx. The only thing that makes UPS as, uh, U U USPS as competent as it is, is competition from FedEx. And, and UPS. If they didn't have that competition, the, the mail service would be far worse than it is. Public schools versus private schools. No comparison. Private schools' outcomes are far, far superior. Department of Motor Vehicles, one of my favorite government bureaucracies, which has apparently made no progress in the, in the past uh, 100 years. Uh, and next time you're in a TSA line, think about the service you're getting there versus the service you get from Amazon.com. But somehow or another, we need more government to make sure everything's fairer and more just. A second principle that makes capitalism uh, ethical, more ethical than the alternatives, is it's based on individual liberty, freedom, self-responsibility, while Anti-capitalism is ultimately based on forcing the individual to submit to the dictates of governmental bureau bureaucrats. Again, capitalism is ultimately based on individuals creating and exchanging with one another. Ultimately, when you don't have that, the alternative is some type of governmental coercion. The makers versus the takers. The anti-capitalist attack capitalism fundamentally on inequality. That's their, their big issue. And it's based on a, and so therefore, they feel justified in taking the wealth that businesses create and redistributing it to make it more fair. Whereas capitalism ultimately rewards those who are enterprising, creative, honest, hardworking, prudent, savers, responsible, and frugal. Anti-capitalism ultimately rewards those who are just the opposite. People who are a little bit lazy, maybe not very prudent, imprudent, wasteful, extravagant, and potentially negligent. What anti-capitalism likes to argue is that there's classes, right? The argument I've heard so much is there's this 1% of which I suspect most of the people in this room fall into the 1%. And then there's the 99%, and the 1% are robbing the 99%. So that justifies expropriating the money that the 1% creates and redistributing it to the 99%. I'm going to submit that there are two classes. There's the creative class, who produces wealth, 
And then there's a class who uses the force of government to take that money away and redistribute it to whoever they feel like is most deserving of it. The makers versus the takers. All right, so the ethical argument that I always hear again and again and again is capitalism is increasing inequality, right? Isn't that the argument we hear the most? That somehow or another it's just not fair because the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. But is it true? Is that really what's happening? We saw earlier a chart where I showed 95% of everybody alive used to be poor, and now they're more prosperous. But yes, of course, some are more prosperous than others, and that, that tends to upset many people. This is an interesting chart. This is the, sort of the economic history of our United, United States, all the way from 1774 to 2011. And you can see the top 20%, interestingly enough, the top 20% get less of the U.S. income than they did back in 1860. And approximately, but whether it be 1774, 1860, or 2011, pretty close. The bottom 40% are actually now getting more than they got back in 1860. But you can see, basically, there has been very little change. Basically, the distribution of wealth that markets produce in the United States have been remarkably consistent. So it's just simply not true that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And this next slide will show it even more clearly. This was, look at these, this chart, is, if you look on the left, you'll see it uh, starts in, in what, what it was like in 1967. And then on the right, you see what it was like in 2014. So if we, uh, these are adjusted for 2014 dollars. So, in 1967, 38.7% of our households made $35,000 or less. That's decreased 500 basis points to 33.7%. Mind you, in my opinion, that's still way too high. But you can see that over the last uh, uh, 47 years, there has been progress in reducing household low income. It's less than it used to be. But what we hear increasingly is the middle class is disappearing, right? Isn't that what we hear all the time in the media? The middle class is disappearing. It looks like it is. In 1967, 53.2% of the people, of the households, were making between $35,000 and $100,000, and now it's only 41.6%. Clearly, the middle class is disappearing. Well, where are they disappearing to? They're disappearing, they're becoming richer because in 1967, only 8.1% of the people of the households made over $100,000. Now, a staggering, think about this, 25% of all households now make over $100,000. Is that, is that a bad thing? Wouldn't it be great if it was 50% making over $100,000? Do you doubt that in another 47 years, it will be over? 50% making over 100? I don't. Probably be sooner than that. We are becoming increasingly a wealthy society, and not just for a few, but for more and more people. Lastly, I want to talk about the Nordic countries, because this is what's held up as the ideal, that the Sweden and Norway, and, and, uh, and these are, there's many things to admire about the Nordic countries. I admire many things about them. I do want to put one thing in perspective. You add all the Nordic countries up together, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, Iceland, anybody else I left out of there that's kind of up in that area, um, their whole entire population is smaller than Texas. They're also pretty homogenous. They're pretty much the same racial identity, and they have long traditions of, self, of, of uh, community help, and their social capital of trust and honesty is pretty much off the charts. Some of the highest social trust scores you'll ever get. But here's what's most interesting. On the economic freedom index, these countries are capitalistic. They may have a very well-developed social welfare state, maybe things that the United States might want to study. But look, Denmark's right below the United States. We're number 11, they're number 12. 
Even Sweden is number, is number 26. And how does that work out here? The Swedish model, what most people don't understand, when Sweden became wealthy is when they, in the early part of the 20th century, they were super capitalistic. They were one of the most economically free nations in the world back for most of the 20th century. And then beginning in about uh, the 60s, Sweden began to ratchet up its uh, more socialistic policies, and economic freedom radically declined, as did their economic prosperity. You had the citizens like Bjorn Borg, the great tennis star, migrating out of Sweden to escape confiscatory taxes, so he moved into Monaco. However, what people don't know is that since 1993, Sweden has gone completely the opposite direction. Sweden's reduced their public spending from 67% of the GDP to 49% today, and they dropped their top marginal tax rate they were trying to get beyond Borg with from 84% to 57%. That's still pretty high by American standards. But look, look how they treat their businesses. Corporate tax rate, 22% maximum rate in Sweden. 20, wouldn't that be incredible if we had that? I, I could use a little Swedish socialism if I got a 22% uh, corporate tax rate. That would be something to behold. It's 39% in the United States, plus you got the state taxes on top of that. And I know some big corporations are able to, you know, uh, get, get their money out of the country and do all kinds of tax tips. Whole Foods Market's not one of them. So our marginal tax rate's about 43%. The government is taking big bucks from us, and there's not a darn thing we can do about it except envy Sweden for their very progressive uh, treatment of business. <laughs> Here's the thing to know about Sweden and all the Nordic countries. These are firmly capitalistic countries that have a great deal to teach us both in capitalism as well as perhaps some of their things they've done in their social welfare component. Uh, but that's what they are. They're capitalistic countries that have strong developed safety net. So let me, let me conclude. I believe capitalism is the most important creation in human history. They are, it's made everything else possible. 200 years ago, over 95% of everyone alive was poor and illiterate and they didn't live to be past about 30. But we are now on track to wipe out abject poverty. Capitalism is going to wipe it out. The entrepreneurs in this room are going to help wipe it out in just about 25 years. Capitalism is also not unethical. It is the most ethical economic system ever, ever created because it's based on voluntary exchange for mutual gain and benefit instead of government coercion and plunder. Capitalism is not increasing inequality. It doesn't reward everyone equally. That's true. It rewards creativity and entrepreneurship, hard work and value creation. The people who create the most value for others receive the biggest rewards. Ultimately, capitalism rewards value creation and creativity. And look, I'm not going to stand up here and say capitalism is a perfect system. It's not. It will not create utopia. It will not create utopia. However, if we want to create a better world, we will understand that it has to be on the platform of capitalism. And from that platform, conscious capitalism springs up to a higher place. Conscious capitalism recognizes that business has the potential for higher purpose. Every business does. Secondly, it recognizes that all the stakeholders matter, that we have to consciously create value for all of our stakeholders, not just our investors. Third, we know the importance of leadership, servant leadership, leaders who are, we've seen several of them up here, leaders who are creative, who are committed to their higher purpose, and who serve their stakeholders. I've been inspired many times today just listening to some of the entrepreneurs up here. Um, and finally, conscious capitalism is going to create a cultures that allow human beings to flourish and to, uh, uh, to prosper. And let me, let me conclude by actually making an ask. I'm going to make an ask to the, to the audience today. We're losing economic freedom in the United States. It is declining. I see it. If you are paying attention, you see it as well. 
And as economic freedom declines in America, it's going to decline. Our prosperity is going to decline. We're going to leave our children and our grandchildren a less prosperous America than the America that was bequeathed to us. Many people hate business. The media doesn't like it. The intellectuals don't like it. If we don't defend capitalism, we're going to lose it. And conscious capitalism won't exist without capitalism as its platform. So my ask today, we are the value creators. We are the heroes in the story. But if we're unwilling to defend the system that has made our creativity, our value creation possible, then we are not doing a service to humanity. We are not elevating humanity. If we won't defend capitalism, who will? Who will defend it? So my ask today is begin to defend not just conscious capitalism, but defend capitalism and then bridge to the fact that, yes, capitalism is good, but we can make it better. We can make it better, and that's what conscious capitalism aims to do. Thank you very, very much.